the podcaster's guide to the conspiracy, brought to you today by Josh Edison and Dr. M. Denton. Hello and welcome to the podcaster's guide to the conspiracy. I am Josh Edison in Auckland, New Zealand. They are Dr. M. Dentith in Hamilton, Kirikiriroa, New Zealand. Uh, it's a it's a balmy spring evening. Are we both in short sleeves? I am. I mean, I'm I'm kind well, of wearing... shortish. I don't know. It's it's almost like it's not it, winter anymore. Which short is nice. sleeve beneath my other short sleeved garment. Very well. Um, no, it's not as warm down here in Kirikiri. I suppose it wouldn't be. Tamaki mm, Makaura. No, but it's almost starting to not feel like winter, which is a plus. Um, now, we, we have a, another episode of Conspiracy Theory Masterpiece Theatre for you this week. Delayed by a week? Why was it delayed by a week, Joshua? Uh, it was delayed by a week because there's a lot going on in this one. And um, early last week, I thought, okay, let's have a flip through this paper and see what it's got to say for itself, and realized I'd bitten off a little more than I could chew and needed the extra week to really get to grips with what was going on there. So fortunately, uh, there was an interview with Brian up our collective sleeves, up your sleeves more than mine, I suppose, and we were able to hear that instead. An adequate summation of what happened last week. Congratulations. Mm. Indeed. Um, So, before we get into it, is there any admin? I'm not aware of any myself. No, in fact, the only admin is actually going to occur in the Patreon episode, in that there's an interesting thing I was asked to almost do an expert review on this week, which we'll be talking about in the patron bonus episode, which means basically there's a mystery of something we could be talking about but aren't talking about. And if you want to find out what that is, well, a dollar a month will get you access to the secrets from beyond the stars. Mm, well, I know I'm intrigued, uh, but let's put that to one side, leave them well, stewing in expectation. That's what I just said, we mm. have put that to one side. And let us... Put to one side at all. It's been put to one side. Yep. It's been on the side. I can't even see it now. It's podcast. totally out of my peripheral vision, even. Uh, so now I guess there's nothing to do, but um, leap straight into the episode where we look at Charles Pigden's Complots of Mischief. Poor Tom's a cold. No. Do I need to put a clap in when you put a clap in for the audio? Oh, I suppose I I mean, um, unless you stop and... Unless it's at the same time. Yeah, Yeah. yeah. fair enough. So, Charles Pigden. Been a while since we heard from him. Um, but, and yet, when we did hear from him, he was the guy who started it all off. It was his, um, his popper revisited that kind of got this whole ball rolling. Uh, and now we're looking at uh, his contribution to conspiracy theories, the philosophical debate, Ashgate 2006, which is what we've been looking at for the last two, is it three, conspiracy theory masterpiece theatres is. Um, and essentially what this is, is... Charles Pigden is reacting to Brian L. Keeley and Steve Clark's reactions to Popper Revisited. Uh, and he has a bit of fun while he's doing it. Um, he uses the Shakespearean tragedy Coriolanus um, as sort of an illustration. Colliery what? Uh, Coriolanus. Some people Coriolanus. might say... I'm not quite hearing that, that last part of the word. Corally... Well, there, there, there are, there are uh, schools of thought as to the pronunciation. Some will say Coriolanus, and some will say Coriolanus. Now, fortunately, we're both mature adults who can say Coriolanus and think nothing of it. It uh, reminds me of that, of that Futurama joke. Yes, yes we, knew, we knew that you people back in the 21st century used to snigger at the name of Uranus, so we changed it to Eurectum. Yes, classic humour. But yes, I, 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 I think Coriolanus sounds more Latin-y, but who knows, it could indeed be Coriolanus, and there's nothing wrong with that. Just out of interest, have you, um, you met my friend Biggis Dickus? He has a wife, you know. Would you like to know her name? It's Incontinentia. 
incontinentia buttocks. <laughs> anyway, enough Monty references. Um, because indeed the actual play currently, oh no, sorry, but, but before I start this, uh, when I first started trying to get into this and do it, I actually had to do like a bit of extra research beyond just reading the thing because I have, I have no idea what the play Coriolanus is about. So I popped onto Wikipedia to get myself a good summary and just, just the general gist of it. And what do I see at the very bottom of the actual Wikipedia page on Coriolanus? Oh, the Coriolanus of the page. Mm. Uh, there's a section on parody, which lists a couple of things and finishes with, based on Coriolanus and written in blank verse, Complots of Mischief is a satirical critique of those who dismiss conspiracy theories. Written by philosopher Charles Pigden, it was published in Conspiracy Theories, The Philosophical Debate. So how about that? It's actually it got a mention on the official Coriolanus Wikipedia page. Now, do you want to give listeners a quick pricey of the play? That might be useful, yes. So, I mean, it's, it's a historical tragedy. Uh, it's about a Roman general called Caius Martius, who then earns the, the, the cognomen, the official nickname Coriolanus, after a big battle at Corioli, um, and then is persuaded to go into politics, become a senator, I think. Uh, but senators Brutus and Sicinius conspire against him. Uh, and uh, Corleanus, who ha having expressed uh, sort of a fairly dim view of the common folk in the past, apparently they sort of turn the, the, the commoners against him, uh, inciting a riot, uh, knowing that this will provoke him, being a, a fairly, fairly hot-tempered fellow, to shoot his mouth off, mouth off in public and make himself look dumb, which he does, uh, and ends up getting banished for his troubles, and then he goes off to his former enemies and... and comes back with them to extract revenge and there's all all your Shakespearean vengeance and betrayal and death and so on and and it's all very um very very tragic fittingly enough now um, people who are listening attentively will go oh Brutus Brutus mm. where have I heard the name Brutus before in a Shakespearean tragedy so what's really interesting about this play is it almost acts as a counterpoint or sibling to the play Julius Caesar in which there's also a conspiracy against the titular character led by someone called Brutus. But in the case of Coriolanus, Coriolanus is a reactionary or conservative politician who is conspired against by populist senators. Whilst Julius Caesar, of course, is a case of the reactionary Brutus conspiring against the populist in the shape of Julius Caesar. So they end up being mirrors of each other with respect to the conspiracy and the person being conspired against. Hmm. Actually, one more point about the name. For the longest time, I was I had the eye in the wrong place. I kept saying Coriolanus, and it took I had to reprogram myself to say Coriolanus. And the way I ended up doing it was when I realized I was saying Coriolanus, Cor Coriolanus, uh, like, like I would say Alanis in Alanis Morissette and I ended up to myself going on a whole Ed Byrne kick saying how big is your St. Coriolanus but anyway, Cori Coriolanus now see I'm doing it to, I, should, I knew I shouldn't have done it, I knew I shouldn't have said how I used to pronounce it because that would infect my brain with the bad thing again, doesn't matter anyway, to the paper to Charles Pigden's Complots of Mischief, so it's in two parts um Part one is all based around um, Coriolanus, and then part two sort of breaks out of that mold, but we'll get to that. Um, so he has a quick word about the um, Brutus and Sicinius's actions and, and makes, you know, establishes that, that very definitely counts as a conspiracy what they're doing. They're plotting together in secret to achieve a particular end. Um, and uh, Charles Pigden sort of sets things up by saying... <clears throat> Coriolanus is indeed such a hothead that even if he knew they were plotting to provoke him, he might not be able to resist being provoked. However, he does not know it, which means that the subsequent unforgivable outburst which brings about his downfall is likewise the result of a secret plan. The prov provocative actions are public, but the provocative purpose is not, though it is pretty clear that the other senators, who desperately try to shush the irrepressible Coriolanus, have wised up to what Brutus and Sicinius are about. Coriolanus himself, though not the most intellectually well endowed of Shakespeare's heroes, is well aware that he's the victim of a conspiracy, and a conspiracy, moreover, which is part of a larger plan to curb the will of the nobility. Um, so he gives a summary of what happened in Shakespeare, and then starts relating this to his own arguments against Ke Keely and Clark by saying, 
politics, even democratic politics, is often a rather conspiratorial business, and those who believe it to be so, that is, conspiracy theorists, would appear on the face of it to be perfectly rational. However, this is not the opinion of Keeley and Clark. How would they respond to the rather dim-witted and choleric conspiracy theorist Caius Martius Coriol Anus? Da, 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 da. And so then you get, for, I didn't actually count the number of pages, but for many pages... It is a, half of the article. It's, it, it is indeed. It's, it, at length, we get this uh, faux Shakespearean dialogue where um, Pigden imagines a, a talk between Coriolanus, Keeley, and Clark, um, sort of, I guess, in the style of the old um, your, your, your Plato's Socratic dialogues and stuff like that, where basically um, Keeley and Clark will try to persuade Coriolanus not to believe that there is a conspiracy against him, and Coriolanus uh, disagrees. And I, I assume there Coriolanus is basically speaking for Pigden himself. Um, yes, I mean, it's actually interesting comparing the Coriolanus of the play, who is not aware that there's a conspiracy against him, versus the way that Pigden writes him in his dialogue, where Keeley and Clark are trying to dissuade Coriolanus, do not believe in conspiracies against you. And Coriolanus is going, but you fools. I am aware that people lie. I am aware that politicians conspire. What kind of vile cold money are you trying to do here to make me not believe the evidence of my own senses? Mm. Um, and so to be fair, it, it's all, it's a little bit dense um, and, and, at times hard to follow, what with the Shakespearean English, um, but the philosophical work that's written in faux Shakespeare. Mm. Uh, but then there are fairly extensive footnotes to the section as well, though, where, where Charles actually gives a bit of detail on uh, precisely what his arguments are with, with what um, Keeley and Clark have to say. Um, so we'll get to what he has to say in a minute, but it sh should say that uh, after that, part two, which is no longer written as a Shakespearean dialogue, it's just a standard sort of essay format, um, he ditches the Shakespearean reference, uh, um, acknowledging that uh, allusions to, to um, Coriolanus will only take you so far, and eventually you, 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 you can't stretch the metaphor to really cover the events of more uh, modern history. Um, but basically he wants to argue that and I quote, the idea that there is something intellectually suspect about conspiracy theories as such, which is presupposed by the use of conspiracy theory and conspiracy theorists as generalized terms of intellectual abuse, is simply a superstition, indeed one of the most idiotic and dangerous superstitions of the present age. Which um, sounds like basically a restatement of his original argument in Popper Revisited. Yes, and indeed it is a restatement he makes in all of his papers, in part because, as we'll get to at the end of the discussion of this particular chapter, Charles is not just responding to Keeley and Clark here. Charles is basically admonishing the philosophers who do not think that we should take conspiracy theory seriously by going, look, we know conspiracies occur, we know conspiracies are everywhere. If you claim to be a literate person, either with respect to history or modern media coverage, you are a conspiracy theorist. There's no two bones about it. So why this general suspicion of conspiracy theories? Surely that seems a little bit superstitious. Mm. And he does, I mean at times comes across as being a little a little worked up at this really a little he's he sort of feels he set out uh, originally this idea that you know there is nothing inherently suspect about conspiracy theories and using them to as he says a term of intellectual abuse to use the terms pejoratively um, just reflects the silly superstition that there's something wrong with them and yet here as uh, to his eyes uh, a whole lot of people are still running around um, uh, perpetuating the superstition that he wants to get rid of. Um, so what does, um, how, how does he define a conspiracy theory? That's probably an important place to start. Well, that's a, that's a good point, because a lot of the philosophical work on conspiracy theory actually goes into exactly what we take mm. 
operating definition of what counts as a conspiracy theory. And Charles defines a conspiracy as a secret plan on the part of some group to influence events by partly covert action. I will add the proviso that either the plan or the action must be morally suspect, at least to some people. And he then continues with the claim, nobody halfway sane supposes that the events of 9-11, because we're talking about mm -hmm. 9-11 now, were not due to some conspiracy or other. Yes, I thought that was an interesting little uh, point to put in there, which, uh, because Lee's paper from the same book that we looked at not too long ago was also, uh, we, we are now, uh, first of all, mentioning 9-11, and yes, acknowledging that no matter what you think about it, it's a conspiracy theory one way or another. The, um, the proviso that there must be something morally suspect about it, at least to some people, um, is is questionable certainly it seems like something we would we would question i mean I, I i at least he says it must be morally suspect at least to some people so obviously while you get you know say the likes of al-qaeda planning a terrorist attack may believe that they are righteous they would at least know that other people would think what they're doing is morally suspect so he doesn't need to say that you know everybody will find it but but nevertheless it's um we it, it it does uh it does kind of discount the possibility of of a benign conspiracy theory which is something we've always wanted to acknowledge isn't it yes yeah, so i would say it is true that when you suspect a conspiracy is going on you are right to think that is suspicious because people acting secretly behind your back really is a kind of suspicious activity but nothing about the fact that an activity is suspicious tells you it's morally suspicious because even though, as you point out, Charles is not wedded to the idea that morally suspicious means morally sinister, it's also not the case that just because something is suspicious, it must be morally suspicious. Sometimes people do things behind people's backs for all sorts of reasons that are in no way immoral at all. And we're aware that people are engaging in activities behind our backs which have no moral weight in any way, shape or form. So I don't think you need to put the qualifier morally. You just need to say, look, conspiracies are suspicious. Some of those suspicious activities will be morally suspect, but not everything which is suspicious means that something, someone is up to doing no good. Mm. Um, and then in part two, he, he goes to um, some lengths to talk about the amount of conspiracy in the historical record. Um, That's been majority of the second half of the paper is simply a litany of here's a conspiracy here's another conspiracy mm. want more conspiracies here's another conspiracy you want you want you want historical conspiracies here's some you want current day conspiracies here's some conspiracy 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 mm. he in fact just takes the writings of david hume um, and goes through that with a fine-toothed comb, pointing out every single time the word conspiracy is show, shows up just in, just in the writings of Hume, and there's a lot of them, and then sort of, you know, extrapolates from that to the rest of history. Um, and then, yes, moves into the present day, talking about the amount of conspiracy that's gone on in the present day, the political conspiracies, um, you know, leading up to 9-11, the Iraq war that followed, and so on and so on and so forth. Um, and finishes up this, this, with this litany of, of conspiracy theories throughout all of human existence by saying, conspiracy in short is endemic in political life, a fact that should be fairly obvious to anyone who bothers to read the newspapers or watch the nightly news. Hence, most politically literate people are conspiracy theorists on a grand scale since they believe in a large number of conspiracy theories, though many of them, so it seems, are unaware of it. And... Um, it does, it's, it's, it does certainly seem that sort of reading through the whole paper, it's kind of just um, uh, aimed squarely at anyone who thinks conspiracy theories are inherently suspect. But um, Keeley and Clark do seem to bear the brunt of his, of his displeasure. Now, admittedly, that is because it is 2006. And the number of philosophers who have written on conspiracy theory at this point if you discount Charles, since he's writing this particular paper, is Lee Basham, Steve Clark, David Cody, and Brian Alkeely. Cody is in agreement with Pigton, as is Basham. Keeley and Clark, on the other hand, are at least at this point in the literature, 
being put forward as the people who defend a skepticism of conspiracy theories generally. Now, as we've noted in these reappraisals of these early papers in conspiracy theory, theory in philosophy, that seems to be unfair, particularly with respect to Brian's work, as we've discussed in numerous episodes. However, it is consistent with the tone of the literature at the time, and will continue to be the tone of the literature for quite some time to come, that people do take Clark and Keeley as being skeptics of conspiracy theories in a general sense. Mm. Now, that may well be based upon an uncharitable reading, but it is the reading that was the common view at the time. Mm. Yes, so maybe possibly when I read this paper, I was a little uncharitable to Charles because I read through it reading what he says about Keeley and Clark and most of the time thinking, but that's not what they said. But maybe that's because I have been part of this this reevaluation of their papers and and I'm not getting the feel of what it was at the times. But I mean, he 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 does seem to be saying that Keeley and Clark were saying that all conspiracy theories should be disbelieved. Uh, that, that that's that's what it came across. But but even um, if you just look literally at you know without without worry about sort of critical reappraisal and reevaluation and so on. At the conclusion of, of conspiracy theories, Brian L. Keeley says specifically, for Hume, miracles are by definition explanations that are ne were never warranted in believing. If my analysis here is correct, however, we cannot say the same thing about conspiracy theories. They are not by definition unwarranted, which seems quite, you know, quite, quite cut and dry. He isn't saying... Quite categorical. Mm, quite categorical. And yet reading through uh, complots of mischief, it doesn't seem like that was that, that, that's the view that Pigden is ascribing to Keeley. Then again, that's also the view that Basham is ascribing to Ke Keeley in slightly different terms as well. It's also the view that I will, once we start looking at my early work, be ascribing to Keeley. We're all ascribing this view to Keeley because in part we're building off each other's work and also in part, as we discussed when we talked about of conspiracy theories, there is an issue between the second half and the first half. I don't know why I did the se se second half first and the first half last. There's an issue between the two halves of that paper where Brian might be just a little lax in tracking whether he's talking about conspiracy theories generally or mature conspiracy theories in the discussion in the second half. And maybe that's what's causing this issue. Now, it's still an uncharitable reading, which doesn't actually fit in with the text as we have seen. But it is, as I said, the reading that is common at this time. Mm. Um, so Pigden, Pigden says of, of uh, Brian L. Keeley, um, that he subscribes to the weaker thesis that although conspiracies sometimes occur, it is usually, no, he does acknowledge that both Keeley and Clark acknowledge that there, there have been conspiracies, that, um, that they, they, they don't deny their existence entirely, um, that although conspiracies sometimes occur, it is usually not rational to believe in them, especially if the corresponding theory displays some of the following features. One, it runs counter to some received official or obvious account. Two, it postulates nefarious intentions on the part of the plotters. Three, it ties together seemingly unrelated events, a heinous, heinous crime this, and or four, the truths behind the events explained are well-guarded secrets, even though the perpetrators may be well-known public figures. And I read that and thought, that doesn't sound familiar to me at all. Those aren't criteria that I recall coming up in, in any of um, Brian's works. Where, where, where did those come from? That's a very good question. So I, I looked at that section as well with your question of actually where do these conditions come from? I think condition one, which is the runs counter to some received official or obvious account, seems more like Cody's reading of Keeley here, given that Cody talks about official theories and official stories. Something we'll be coming back to when we look at his paper specifically on that particular criteria in a few weeks' time. Two, the idea it postulates nefarious intentions on the part of the plotters. There's a little bit of that in Keeley's work. Most of the early work on conspiracy theory 
does really focus on conspiracy as being a bad thing. But also it seems a lot like Charles's approach towards discussing conspiracy in the early part of this paper. So it seems that he's ascribing a slightly stronger version of his own view to Keeley here. Three, as you pointed out in the notes for the show, which is the talk about seemingly unrelated events being tied together, this does seem like it's a reference to Brian's talk of errant data. So that seems to be something which we can tie to Brian, although it's put forward in a way which doesn't seem to be quite what Brian is talking about here. Brian is talking about a very sophisticated move in epistemology with respect to how do we actually work out what data goes with which particular explanation and the fact that sometimes the data which goes with one explanation will not be explained by another or vice versa. And four basically is a kind of weird claim which I suppose is plausible to a certain extent that the kind of conspiracies we're interested in are going to be political ones. Because the claim is the perpetrators may be well-known public figures. So we go, look, we're not re when we're talking about conspiracy theories and the ones we tend to disbelieve, they tend to be political conspiracies because they're the ones that we don't think, I say we don't think here in scare, scare quotes, we don't think happen in the kind of societies in which we live. And of course, Charles spends an awful lot of time in the second part of this paper going, but look, they do occur in the societies in which we live. So how do you explain that? Mm. So yes, I mean, this, th th that whole section struck me as a little bit odd. It, it, it first shows up in the footnotes to part one, where, as I said, he sort of that, that, that's where he actually gives the, the nitty gritty of some of his arguments. And then it's um, stated again, th those four points show up again um, in the body of part two. Um, I don't know how much of this is uh, the problem that we've seen show up quite a few times now and that Brian himself uh, is, is a little unclear sometimes about whether he's talking about conspiracy theories in general or just those good old unwarranted mature ones. And once again, I will say this was the tenor of criticism at the time, which is not to say it was justified. It just happens to be this is how people are talking about that particular work. Hmm. Um, he does say to, to make an interesting move, though, which I, I, I thought was um, uh, remarkable, that he, he turns one of Brian's arguments against him. Um, you'll recall that uh, one of so the, the, the problem that Brian has with conspiracy theories, the, the thing that he says can make them bad, is when they lead to that, and indeed this is something you guys talked about in the um, in the interview just last week, the, the, the sort of scepticism that, in, that they can engender, the, the amount of stuff that you have to discard as, as untrue or unreliable if you really buy into some of these conspiracy theories. Um, and Charles basically says, um, well, if you're going to say that conspiracy theories are suspect, then you are going to have to throw out most of history because, as I've just shown, history is full of them. Um, how does he say it specifically? Indeed, it seems to me that we can employ a variety of Keeley's chief argument against the superstition that he indirectly supports. If conspiracy theories are systematically suspect, then what we think we know about the past is systematically suspect. The memoirs, the annals, and the testimonies on which we rely, and in many cases the confessions and correspondence of the conspirators, would have to be regarded with suspicion. But if we adopted that attitude, our knowledge of the past would dissolve into con conjecture. We would, in effect, be committing epistemic suicide, at least with respect to large chunks of the past. Which is an interesting point, although again, it really does rest on the idea that people are saying all conspiracy theories are, are suspect per se, which... Um, these days, you know, I, I think it keeps coming back to this thing. These days, we don't think... Brian was saying that, and it's what we want to say, but yes, I guess back then that is what people thought. Yes, and in many respects, Charles's target may not be Brian per se here. Charles's target is philosophers who go, well, you know, we shouldn't treat conspiracy theories seriously. I mean, they're not the kind of thing that happens to occur. That gives us a good reason to go that conspiracies you know, aren't important. And Charles is going, look, if you think along those lines, a line which I have put on Keeley, 
then look, here's the rejoinder. You, are, you now have to reject a large amount of history if you want to maintain that line, which means actually you, don't, you know nothing about the past, which means in a weird logical conundrum, you are going, well, look, conspiracies don't occur. What's my information for that? No information whatsoever. I know nothing about the past. I've just rejected all of history, at which point you have a superstition. Yes, and it, I, I, that, that is the impression I get that, um, that Charles is, is kind of addressing a much more general audience, just anyone who thinks that conspiracy theories are inherently um, unwarranted, but it's, it, he's focusing specifically on the arguments of Keeley and Clark. Um, and he does indeed turn to Clark after he's had a look at um, Brian's views. He says that uh, Clark argues that conspiracy theories are intellectually suspect for two reasons. One, they typically constitute the cause of degenerating research programs. And two, they typically attribute too much causal influence to human dispositions and not enough to the social situation. Hence, they commit the fundamental attribution error. Now, I want to point out at this point, Charles has probably not read Clark's reply to his own paper was appealing to the fund fundamental attribution error, a mistake. So, of course, he's only replying to Clark's first paper and not the chapter in this volume where Clark slightly retracts that view. Mm. And it seemed, again, it, I, I, I wouldn't call it a, a misreading of um, Steve Clark's paper, but it did seem to sort of twist the emphasis a little bit where, where Clark seemed mostly, you know, he, he wanted to um, say what was wrong with conspiracy theories by looking at the psychology of conspiracy theorists. So it wasn't so much he was saying that conspiracy theories um, result in the fundamental attribution era themselves, but conspiracy theorists, especially the ones who stick to these degenerating research programs, are committing that error. Um, and he does, and again, I mean, Clark said, if, if you remember way back to, um, what was Clark's one of conspiracy theories? No, that was Brian's one. Which That's is the... I, I can now only think of the oh, uh, conspiracy theories... And oh, conspiracy like, theorizing. No, yeah, because I, yeah, I was actually about to name his next paper, mm. conspiracy theories and controlled demolition. No, it's conspiracy theories and conspiracy yeah. theorizing. Uh, which, I mean, near the end, he, he says, uh, Steve Clark says, giving a thousand conspiracy theories some consideration is a small price for us to pay to have one actual nefarious conspiracy, such as the Watergate conspiracy, uncovered sooner rather than later. So, I mean, even, even back then, he, A, acknowledged that real conspiracies occur, and B, said that although these things appear to be um, suspect, it, it pays to look into them because every now and then a real one pops up. Um, Charles Pickens, of course, has wanted, is wanting to say, no, it's not just that every now and then a real conspiracy, a real conspiracy pops up. They're all over the damn place. They're everywhere. So um, I, I can still see that he would possibly have issue with that. He did, at one point, he, note, uh, he does say, talking about when the few times when Keeley and Clark um, mention actual conspiracies that really have happened and which their four theories about would be valid. He says the only conspiracy theories that Clark himself appears to believe in are the Iran-Contra and Watergate conspiracies. From this we conclude that reading history is not his chief evocation. And it's not often that I read a philosophy paper and say out loud, ooh, you bitch. But, um, but I did. Cutting remark, is it not? It is, it is fairly cutting. Um, so yeah, he, he, um, he, he's, not, he's not in any way sympathetic, I would say, towards what Cleely and Clark have to say. And um, as I think as, as Lee Basham's papers that we've looked at showed, at least initially there, Keeley and Clark both seem to be trying to identify at least, at least one kind of conspiracy theories that are prima facie unwarranted. They, they both seem to start the earlier papers from the position that, well, okay, conspiracy theories, we, we, we have this intuition that there's something wrong with them. Now, we know conspiracies do occur, so that means some conspiracy theories have to be good, but how can we, how can we justify for a class of conspiracy theories at least um, being, being inherently suspect of them? And so you get Brian's mature unwarranted 
conspiracy theories and Clark's um, degenerating research programs. And then Lee comes along and says, ah, but re really the problem with that is that you're um, trying to come up with a class of conspiracy that's, that's inherently suspect, but you end up just sort of saying that the suspect ones are suspect, that bad conspiracies are bad, and the real question is not what's the class of, of bad conspiracy theories, rather just simply how do you tell individual particular, if you will, conspiracy theories, uh, the good ones from the bad ones. Um, so I'm, I think so. I think Lee sort of identifies a problem with their approach, but it doesn't seem to be the problem that Pigden's addressing in this paper. Um, certainly the, the, the idea that the, the, the thing that really seemed in both Keeley and Clark's papers to be the thing that, that, that concerned them was the fact these people who stick to the, their, un, their mature unwarranted conspiracy theories, stick to their degenerating research programs well past the point when they should go, give up on them, uh, although it's not entirely clear um, when that point is. Yes, as we've seen with the discussion both of maturity and degeneration with respect to Keeley and then to Clark, it's one thing to say, look, you shouldn't believe in mature conspiracy theories, conspiracy theories which persist sans evidence over a long period of time, or conspiracy theories which constitute the core of a degenerating research program when no pro progress has been made for a long time and a lot of effort has been put into it to try and scaffold the theory against criticism. It seems that once you get to that end point, that's a good point to go, well, actually, maybe we should give up belief in these conspiracy theories. Well, the problem is we don't know when a conspiracy theory becomes mature or when a conspiracy theory is an example of a degenerating research program, particularly since, as Keeley points out, if conspirators are good at their jobs, they will be hiding this stuff from us. Mm. But then again, Keeley's concern isn't with truth, his concern is with warrant qua plausibility. It's not the case that we give up on the conspiracy theory because it's false. We give up on the conspiracy theory by saying, look, I've got no good reasons to entertain it at this point in time. Come back to me when you've got new evidence. Mm. Um, so as he goes through the stuff, um, as we said, Charles uh, goes through the historical record, pointing out conspiracy theories as far as the eye can see, and goes looks to more modern day um, examples, in particular looking at the um, the Iraq War II, the the post nine eleven war in Iraq, um, and the various dodgy goings on there, and pointing out the inconsistency or hypocrisy is probably a fair word of various politicians and journalists who would write off any time someone would say uh, a, Western, a Western government is doing something bad, say the dodgy dossier conspiring to, to, to falsify the case for a war in Iraq, um, those sorts of theories would just be written off as, oh, those, those are conspiracy theories and they're therefore inherently crazy. And yet any time someone would bring up what is obviously a conspiracy theory about someone else, say, you know, what, what, what Al-Qaeda is scheming to get up to and so on, they don't find anything suspect about those and are quite clearly are quite happy to, um, to, to countenance those theories. Um, and so he basically sort of says, you know, when these people say conspiracy theories, they really mean conspiracy theories about a Western government. Um, and says that's a real problem, and and I would say he's entirely right to. Um, and it kind of th th this is right near the end of the paper, and I sort of read that bit and kind of thought this 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 really sounds like the people who you're really aiming this at, and it doesn't really seem to be a good um, a, a good portrayal of perhaps Keeley and Clark's views, but certainly there are, and as you, as he points out, there are plenty examples of people who. Um, indulge in this this superstition, as you'd have it, that um, conspiracy theories are just inherently suspect, um, and do so to let powers that be, in some cases, get away with stuff they shouldn't be getting away with. Um, all of which seems like an entirely fair point. Um, so he finishes things off by saying, "But there is no need. To, there is no need to belabor the point." I, I would say that remark comes possibly four or five pages too late. But anyway, uh, Western governments and government agencies have engaged in morally dodgy conspiracies. 
Hence, theories which say they do are not obviously faulty or foolish. So what is the upshot? The idea that conspiracy theories are, as such are somehow intellectually suspect is a superstitious or irrational belief, since there is no reason whatsoever to think it's true. It is an idiotic superstition, since a modicum of critical reflection reveals that it is false. And it is a dangerous superstition, since it invests the lies, evasions and self-deceptions of torturers and warmongers with a spurious air of methodological sophistication. So, if somebody poo-poos a conspiracy theory of yours simply because it is a conspiracy theory, then you know that they are either a knave or a fool, or quite likely an unlovely combination of the two. And yes, while I sort of found myself reading through a lot of this paper, kind of disagreeing with a lot of it, by the time he gets to the end, uh, I think I think that I'm entirely in, agree in agreement with his, his final conclusion. Yeah, so and I should point out, you're disagreeing with his portrayals of Keeley and Clark rather than disagreeing with his ultimate mm, yes. treat conspiracy theory. Mm. And indeed, as you say, I, I have the benefit of 14 years worth of um, uh, uh, work on the field filtered through you into my brain meets, so I, I, I can see things perhaps with a bit more nuance than was available to anyone uh, writing in 2006. Indeed. I mean, mm. a, a lot more work is about to appear, but at this stage we are dealing with a small cohort of writers, and thus there is going to be a little bit of cannibalism. Mm. So um, I do, though, have to say that um, one of the things, one, one of the high points of Charles' original paper was, of course, the reference to Robocop 2 and its conclusion. Um, so I've gone from, from referencing Robocop 2 to actually making me read Shakespeare for the first time since I was like 17 years old in high school. Um, I, 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 I don't see that as, as any sort of an advance, quite frankly. Oh, see, I thought you were going to describe him as a true Renaissance man. Well, I mean, I suppose, yes, you could make that argument as well. But um, frankly, if I wanted to read Shakespeare, I would invent a time machine, uh, swap bodies with my 17-year-old self somehow, and pay a bit more attention when we were talking about uh, King Lear and Seventh Form English. Didn't we watch Titus Andronicus together? No, I've never seen, I've never seen the, the Anthony Hopkins one. Yeah, it's brilliant. No, I've, I've never, never watched that one. I've seen, what have I seen? I've seen the Mel Gibson Hamlet. That might be it. See, whenever I think of Hamlet, Prince of Denmark, I do think of the last action hero. To be, mm. not to be, not to be. Yes. One of the greatest scenes in American cinematic history. Yeah, I... Like I've heard a lot, a lot of people singing the praises of the last action hero and how it was the first postmodern action film. Um, so I remember at the time it wasn't well received, and I remember watching it and going, "Eh," but maybe, maybe my teenage mind or early twenties mind, whenever the hell it came out, just wasn't sophisticated enough to cope with it. It is one of those films that I think has aged particularly well in the same way that Hudson Hawk, a film that was not well received at the time has also aged well. So it played at the movie marathon two years ago now, and watching it on the big screen with a receptive audience truly was wonderful. And seeing a young Charles dance. Even mm. uh, everything's good with the young Charles dance. The Golden Child, I, I did, that's something I have rewatched more recently, the old Eddie Murphy one. And yeah, not, not the best, uh, best example of Eddie Murphy's work, but young Charles dance. Oh my. Oh yes. Oh yeah. Mm. Now talking about things you can go oh my to, we should probably talk about the bonus content that mm. can go oh my to after the break. Yes. Um, so another update on Alexei Navalny. We can it's almost probably time to stop talking about him, but there's still there's still an update to go. Um, apparently, Jesus has been arrested in Russia. About time to. Mm, if you want to know more about that, tune in. Um, there was another another one of those interesting surveys that appears to show uh, an enormous groundswell of belief in in COVID nineteen conspiracy theories. Uh, we'll look into that. Um, Apparently, Action Zealandia had Kerry Bolton on again. Again, again. Again, again. Um, 
and some interesting interesting ideas uh, in the lead up to the general election here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, which is what three weeks away, two and a bit, something. Yeah. Like, is, it, is it two weeks? Three. Advanced voting will be open by this time next week, I believe. Mm. Um, and there have been some interesting, uh, bit, bit of interesting commentary coming up around that that we could perhaps look into. Um, so, if you would like to hear more about that and you're a patron, good news, you're about to. Um, if you'd like to hear about that and you're not a patron, good news, you can become one. Um, if you would like to hear about that and you're not a patron, good news, that's all going to work out for you anyway. Um, and no matter uh, what your particular view on the patron bonus content is, you very definitely listen to the end of this episode. Uh, and thank you for that, basically. Um, so, given that we've 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 uh, had another uh, another instalment of conspiracy theory masterpiece theatre, we've gone through a paper, we've bottomed out on pop culture references. I think all that remains um, is to say goodbye to the nice people listening to us. How would you like to do that this week? I do think that maybe, maybe when we think of goodbyes, I'm reminded of when Ethel first came home from the clinic. You see, Ethel had ideas. You know, I have no idea anything that Harold Pinter has ever done. Who's the singing detective guy? That's not Harold Pinter. No. Uh, no. Then oh, I'm lost. No, I've, I've, I've completely forgotten the name. Who did... Uh... Oh, I've actually now forgotten... And every... lipstick on your collar. Yeah. And, yeah. And that wasn't... Pushkin. Mm. Reference to one of the last ones he wrote. And it's completely gone out of my head. Well, the point is... I mean... The point I mean, is, I'm culturally illiterate. Like allow us to actually check these things. Mm. The point is, I'm culturally illiterate... So I'm just going to say goodbye. Fair enough. Ethel says goodbye as well. Mm. You've been listening to the podcaster's Guide to the Conspiracy, starring Josh Addison and Dr. M. R. X. Dentit, which is written, researched, recorded, and produced by Josh and M. You can support the podcast by becoming a patron via its Podbean or Patreon campaigns. And if you need to get in contact with either Josh or M, you can email them at podcastconspiracy at gmail.com or check their Twitter accounts, Monkey Fluids and Conspiracism. Remember, they're coming to get you, Barbara.